How can I tell if I have worms? What are the main signs and symptoms? What's the biggest health risk when it comes to worms and parasitic diseases? What's the most effective treatment? Do home remedies actually work, like garlic or papaya seeds? I'll explain everything in this video. You also ask a lot about testing. Are these tests reliable? Are they recommended for everyone? Who should take preventive measures against worms? I'll cover all of this in the video. I've read your comments and gathered all your questions for this video. First, let me explain that worm infections are extremely common. It's estimated that about 50% of people will encounter worms at some point in their lives. And what do most people think? Oh, but I eat cooked meats. Well done meats. I'm not at risk for worms. In reality, there are many ways to get infected like worms in vegetables. Not all worms come from our food though. Some worms come from the soil. If you step on contaminated ground, worms can enter your body. Some worms are even related to water. For example, bathing in ponds with infected snails can lead to diseases I'll explain in this video. So there are various forms of infection, different worms and different symptoms, which I'll explain here. There are six common symptoms present in most worm infections. The seventh sign relates to specific worms crucial for correct diagnosis and treatment. What are the most common signs and symptoms of worms? Number one is weight loss. This can happen due to increased consumption or because the person may lose appetite. So besides eating less and feeling nauseous, there might also be increased consumption. When it comes to worms and weight loss, if you're losing weight without a clear reason like exercise or diet, consider worms. In practice, they're often overlooked and neglected. When someone's losing weight, one of their first thoughts is, oh, it must be cancer. They see a doctor who checks for cancer and hormonal issues like thyroid problems. Many visit me, an endocrinologist, thinking it's a thyroid issue, but few consider that weight loss could be due to worms. In fact, the chance of having worms is much higher than having a rarer disease. We've seen that worms are extremely common. So when there's weight loss, always consider worms. It's a very common condition. If you take this from the video, I'm satisfied, okay? Because it's really a crucial tip. Symptom two, our second sign is bloating, also called abdominal distension. You eat a little and feel full quickly. Another common sign, increased intestinal gas. Your pattern changes, but I'll emphasize abdominal bloating, okay? Sign number three, changes in your eating habits. Some with worms eat more, others lose appetite and eat less. Compare to your usual pattern to identify when it started and what changed. Some worms can increase hunger more, other worms might decrease appetite. We know there are various types of worms. An important clue is where the possible infection occurred. Which part of the world are you in? This can make a big difference. Some regions are endemic for certain worms, so location guides us, along with symptoms as it's more common there. It's a puzzle piece where contamination happened, if they traveled or were in another region. Sometimes it's not countries, but cities. One city might be endemic, while the next isn't. It's fascinating. Since we're talking cities, comment below where you're watching this video from. Which city are you in right now? Also mention if your city has had any worm outbreaks. These parasitic diseases often occur in outbreaks. If there's a common worm in your area, let me know in the comments. I always enjoy reading them. Number four is fatigue. When you have worms, you may feel more tired and sleepy. Besides symptoms causing fatigue, Worms can lead to nutritional deficiencies, mineral loss, and even anemia. I'll highlight some vitamins that can be depleted, like B1, B12, folic acid, and iron. Other minerals too. As you've seen, worms increase consumption, sometimes of specific nutrients. So we assess nutrients and the patient's condition, always considering fatigue and potential worm infections. Like with weight loss, we often think of other diseases, but forget about worms, which are extremely common. If you find this video helpful, please like and share. Let's aim for 5,000 likes. Also, subscribe to follow our channel. Number five is diarrhea, but also constipation. Some worms can cause both, so changes in bowel habits should be noted. Compare your current bowel pattern to your normal one. Changes in either direction could indicate worms. Number six is anemia. Worms can cause nutritional deficiencies which may lead to anemia. Symptoms include paleness, heart issues, and reduced stamina, 
like struggling with stairs you used to climb easily. Other signs are hair loss and weak nails. We can detect anemia through blood tests, checking hematocrit and hemoglobin levels. An interesting clue is also the size of red blood cells. We see this through mean corpuscular volume or MCV, one of those acronyms. Have you seen it? A complete blood count? Did you notice all the acronyms? ever wonder what they mean? Well, one is the volume or size of red blood cells. This can also indicate if you have any deficiencies. For instance, iron levels, low iron or iron deficiency anemia shrinks red blood cells. However, if you have other deficiencies like vitamin B12 or folic acid, it can increase the size of your red blood cells. They can become enlarged, resulting in big red blood cells. What's the normal range between 80 and 100? Iron deficiency anemia can decrease this size to 70, sometimes 65 or 60, while folic acid deficiency can increase it above 100. This is a crucial clue. If you've wondered about these acronyms, you've now learned one of them here. It's vital to consider worm infections as a possible cause, even before starting any treatment. I've seen this often. Patients say, I'm on iron supplements, but it's not working. However, you must also investigate the underlying cause. What's causing this anemia? Number seven, specific symptoms of certain worm types. Pay close attention, as it could be key for diagnosis and treatment. Among these specific signs, yellowing may indicate hookworm disease. Also, anal itching, known as pruritus ani. It could be oxyuriasis, another specific type of worm. Coughing can also be a symptom of worms. Did you know that? Some worms have a pulmonary cycle causing cough symptoms. Sometimes you treat for lung issues or reflux, taking various meds that don't work. Remember to consider worms too. Ascaris can cause intestinal blockage, multiply quickly and grow significantly. There's also a type called neurocystis ercosis or just cystisercosis, which can affect the brain and even cause seizures. So we need to check if it's not some kind of worm problem. The worm that causes neurocysticercosis is called tenia solium. It's found in pork. If you eat undercooked or contaminated pork, you can get infected with this worm. But it's not just in pork. Beef has tenia saginata too. The worm's name is different, but it's also dangerous. Another specific sign is fatty diarrhea. Did you know that? It's called steatorrhea. Fatty stools can indicate a disease caused by giardia or giardiasis. Another worm can cause water belly or ascites in medical terms. You've probably seen someone with this swollen belly or ascites. It's often due to liver problems. But this worm causing schistosomiasis can lead to liver issues and this symptom. You can get infected with schistosomiasis by bathing in fresh water with contaminated snails. Remember when I said not everything is food related? Contrary to popular belief, this worm doesn't require eating raw food to infect you. Some vegetarians think, I don't need to worry about worms since I don't eat meat, raw or otherwise. But many worms don't come from meat or food at all, so it's important to stay aware. Another sign is an increased eosinophil count in blood tests. If eosinophils are elevated, it could be due to allergies, cell changes like an asthmatic bronchitis or certain worms causing eosinophilia, which is an increased eosinophil count. Now let's discuss the tests and treatments. There's a test called stool parasitology where you provide a fecal sample to the lab. They analyze it for any traces of worms, eggs or worm parts. However, not all worms will show up in this test. It's debated whether to request this test or to provide preventive treatment or treatment even before testing. Some studies show that stool tests for parasites can have up to a 50% false negative rate. What does this mean? A person may have worms, but the test comes back normal. This can complicate treatment decisions. So what should we do since we can't fully trust this test? This is a widely debated topic. As a doctor, I recommend treatment based on where the patient lives, their symptoms and periodic deworming. I personally take deworming medication every year. Why? I often eat out for lunch. I can't control restaurant hygiene. Even at good restaurants, you never know. Sometimes staff might have poor hygiene practices or not wash veggies well. I love salads, but meat might be undercooked. Can't control that. We've also seen it's not just about food or specific regions. I think it's worth getting treatment periodically. Talk to your doctor to assess if you need treatment or not. In rural areas, people working with cattle or potentially contaminated animals might need treatment every six months. In some cases, every two years. 
It really depends on the region and your habits. What are the most commonly used medications? Before discussing medications, I'll make a note here. Remember I mentioned the high failure rate of stool tests and that we often opt for direct treatment without testing. This approach is quite controversial, okay? Some professionals, and there's scientific evidence on this, as I always share here, suggesting that for certain groups, it's worth testing first to determine if treatment is needed, all right? This isn't an absolute truth. Medicine evolves, so if your doctor ordered a test, they're not wrong. It's not bad practice or contraindicated to take this test. Since I'm aware of this failure rate, I prefer not to routinely ask everyone, but rather follow the approach I explained. Well, the most commonly used medications are albendazole, secnitazole, metronidazole, mebendazole, and nidazoxanide. Those are the five. Usually, depending on the person's profile, the doctor can choose one or another. I can't recommend one for everyone or say this is the best or worst, as it depends on individual characteristics. As for home remedies, people often ask, do papaya seeds, garlic, or pumpkin seeds really work? The answer is no, okay? Their effectiveness is very, very low. It's not worth eating papaya seeds or raw garlic to treat worms because they don't work, all right? That's the practical answer. If you like eating garlic, I do too. I'm not saying it's bad for you, but for treating worms, it doesn't replace medication, okay? You won't have fewer worms just by eating garlic, for example. While it fights infections and boosts immunity, it's not effective against worms. It won't just drop into your gut and kill the worms, for instance. So don't waste time on home remedies thinking they're fighting worms. There are actually highly effective medicines that can eliminate over 90%, even 99% of worms, depending on the treatment and specific parasite. These are safe medicines that can't be replaced by any home remedy or papaya seeds, for example. It's trendy. You send me many videos I watch, but no, there's no scientific proof. Now, I'll suggest a video where I discuss signs that blood sugar is high, signs and symptoms of diabetes. Want to learn more about it? Now you know about worms, you should learn about diabetes too. Click here to watch that video. Take care. See you next time.